Judges chapter 15. We're supposed to be covering this chapter. We'll we, we see how far we can get. And um, as we continue to go verse by verse and chapter by chapter through the Word of God and through the Old Testament on Wednesdays, and I look forward to just sharing the Word of God with you. It's just such a great blessing. And Father, thank you. Once again, that you've given us your word. You've brought us to the table of your word. We pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would teach us this evening the truths we need to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Judges chapter 15, and we're going to see how far we can get. The title of this message is The Dangers of Fleshly Desires, Part 2. The Dangers of Fleshly Desires, Part 2. I made a mistake and put Part 3 on social media, but it's, I was jumping ahead of myself. It's Part 2. Now, in part one of this study, we saw how Samson began to yield to his fleshly desires, which caused him to go down spiritually. He started to make it about him by constantly saying, I, me, me, and me, which caused him to have a yo-yo up and down walk with God. He started violating the clear teaching of the word of God concerning his Nazarite vow. He started to become secretive, and he started having a, an anger problem. Now, let's continue to see the downward spiral of this great man, Samson. Look what it says there in verses 1 to 3. <clears throat> it says, after a while, in the time of wheat harvest, it happened that Samson visited his wife with a young goat, and he said, let me go into my wife into her room. But her father would not permit him to go. Her father said, I, I really thought that you thoroughly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister better than she? Please take her instead. And Samson said, you got to be kidding me. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah, that was the Tony Clark translation. He said, this time I shall be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. Now, the phrase after a while in verse 1 refers to the time between Samson's wedding day and how he posed a riddle to them that his groomsmen couldn't answer until they threatened the bride. She uh, told, them to, uh, told them the answer, and Samson got angry and killed 30 Philistine men and took their clothes, which was the prize uh, for the one who could answer the riddle. Samson leaves now for a period of time, and now he's coming back to continue uh, the wedding feast. He comes back during the harvest time in verse 1, and that is an important uh, thing to notice, a phrase to notice. Verse 1 tells us he comes back with a young goat, which is a, a, an I am sorry gift. Man, you, you, you know how that is, don't you? Okay. Do you see what can happen to us when we begin to go down spiritually? Our anger gets the best of us. We abandon or desert our wives or families. Then we are coming back with an I am sorry gift. He, <laughs> he should have been offering that young goat up to God. As a, as, a, as a sacrifice saying uh, uh, that I am sorry, Lord, please forgive me. Why? Because sin is always first against God. Oh, D David told us, he taught us this in Psalm 51 verse 4. He said, against you and you only have I sinned and done this wickedness in your sight. Oh, yes, David sinned against Bathsheba by committing adultery with her. But sin is first and always first against God. Always. So instead of him coming with the I am sorry gift to, to his wife, he should have been offering that up first to God. No doubt whatever it is that you're sorry about, make sure before those words come out of your mouth to any human being that you first said them to God. <laughs> you know, Joseph said it himself in, in the book of Genesis. Joseph said it when Potiphar's wife tried to put the moves on him. He said, you know, how can I do this wickedness and sin against God? 
Oh, sure, it would have been a sin against the woman, would have been a sin against Potiphar himself. But he understood that sin is always first against God. And this is what Samson should have been offering up, a, a, a gift or, or a sacrifice to the Lord saying, I am sorry, God, first. Do you need to say that this evening? Do you need to say that you're sorry to God, Lord, forgive me for something Oh, you know God is pointing it out right now. And as you bow your head and as you have a moment between you and God, you definitely need to get it right with him because sin is always first against him. Maybe your spouse or your friend or your coworker doesn't even know yet that you've sinned against them, but God knows because you sinned against him first. Somebody needs to hear that this evening. Somebody needs to hear that. So Samson, he goes to his father's house, uh, and, and, and or the father of the bride, should I say. He went to his house and wanted to go into her room to consummate the marriage uh, at the end of verse 1 says. Her, her father would not permit him to go in. He tells Samson in verse 2, uh, I really thought that you hated her. Now, why would he say that? Watch this. You remember for telling her people the answer to Samson's riddle. Then the father gave his wife to one of his groomsmen. Then the father tried to give Samson the younger sister, who the father said was better looking than the older one. Samson was hot about this. And he says in verse 3, he said, this time I shall be blameless regarding the Philistines if I harm them. Now, he is justifying his anger and bad behavior. Are you trying to justify your anger and your bad behavior uh, uh, towards someone? See, it's a sign that you're in a backsliding condition, trying to justify bad behavior, trying to justify uh, uh, something you're about to do that you know is not right. But you, you, you feel, see, sin will make us feel justified in doing what we're about to do. And as you sit back in the cut and wait for that door to open up for you to get someone back, every day you wait, your sin makes you feel justified in doing what you're doing. It's a sign that you're in a backsliding condition, just like, just like we see here uh, with Samson. Now, look at verses 4 through 6. Said then Samson went and caught 300 foxes, and he took torches, turned the foxes tail to tail, and put a torch between each pair of tails. And when he had set the torches on fire, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and burned up both the stocks and the standing grains, as well as it began to spread to the vineyards and the olive groves. Then the Philistines said, Who in the world did this? Speak up. And they answered, they dimed him out and said, Samson, hey, Samson did the son-in-law of the Timnite because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. So the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. Wow. This is amazing to me. When we go down spiritually, we no longer have the Holy Spirit's power to control our anger. Because the spirit is grieved by our sin. The Bible said, do not grieve the spirit of God. Ephesians 4.30, by whom you sealed to the day of redemption. The word grieve in the Greek is a word, it, it mean, it's lupeo. It's a word that means to cause pain to. The Holy Spirit's job is to produce joy in us. Amen. And when we have grieved the spirit of God, it cannot produce joy. It cannot produce peace. It cannot produce long-suffering, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, long-suffering, and self control. So when we're in a backslidden condition, the Spirit of God is grieved. And when the Spirit of God is grieved, that control that we need over our anger when someone has wronged us, we don't have it. And then we, we become out of control like Samson is here. So he went and caught 300 foxes. How he did that, I never know. 300 foxes. The Hebrew word can be translated jackals or foxes. It can go either way in verse 4. And he took torches and tied their tails together. I don't know how he did all this. 
tied their tails together, and then sent the confused foxes into the fields of the Philistines in verse 5 and burned up the grain as well as the vineyards and the olive groves. <laughs> we know this was a great loss. This was devastating to the Philistines because verse 1 says it was harvest time when Samson did this to them. He burned up their grains, their vineyards, their olive groves, the, the three basic food groups. I just wonder, is your anger burning up everything around you? You always can tell when things are off between you and God as your anger is out of control and burning up everything around you. You can't keep a job. You can't keep friendships. You bust, relationships are always busting up, and you always blaming the other person when it's really you, and it's really your anger, and your lack of being able to get along. Young people with classmates, you can't get along with folks, and it's always them, and them over there, and they, and them, and you fail to look in the mirror and say, oh, it's really you. It's really you. Ephesians 4.26 says, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Why? Verse 27 says, nor give place to the devil. When we allow the sun to go down on our anger, we give Satan place. We give him a foothold to do damage in our lives and in the lives of those around us. This is why whenever you get angry, just know the moment you get angry, all of a sudden, the clock starts ticking. Tick, 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 tick. Because when the sun goes down on your anger, you give Satan foot, it, you give him a foothold. It's, it's an old saying, but it is so true. You give Satan an inch and he'll become your ruler. You just give him a foothold, just a foothold, just a foothold. You give them a foothold. And how do we give them a foothold? Foot By allowing the sun to go down on our anger. Some of you have been angry for a long time. You've been angry with your husband. You've been angry at your spouse. You've been angry at a coworker, at a family member. You've just been angry a long time. The sun has long gone down on your anger. And you get Satan a foothold because what happens is, is when we allow the sun to go down on our anger, we give Satan a foothold to do what? To bring his boys with them. His boys, it, it, he got a boy named Bitterness. And then his boy is Hatred. And then the, the last one that brings up the rear he bats clean up is Murder. See, that's the progression. Oh, you, you're too afraid to pull the trigger because you don't want to go to the pokey. You're too afraid to pull the trigger. But you'll definitely murder them in your heart. And you'll look at them with that, with that, that one eye squint, like that one. And, and with that squint, what you're saying is that, oh, I wish they were dead. You won't pull the trigger, but you definitely pulled it in your heart because of what they've done to you. They hurt you. And because you allowed the sun to go down on your anger, Satan brought his boys with him. And it's a progression that takes place. Jesus said, if you, if you hate someone, you murder them in your heart. Jesus said, anger is at the root of murder, just like lust is at the root of adultery. It's, the, it's, it's what's there. And so, and so as, as soon as, you know, as soon as we allow that sun to go down. So this is why I tell couples, don't go to bed angry. You go to bed angry, you wake up. See, ladies, let me, let me, let me share something with you. For us, we, when we go to bed, we're done with it. <laughs> we're so done. And that's why we wake up, hey, honey, hey, how are you? <laughs> we're so done with that thing. And men, let me let you in on a little secret. They far from done. They just starting. <laughs> because they allow the, the sun to go down on the anger and it's the next morning, and now bitterness has set in. And she is sick just at the sight of you. 
Because you as the man allowed the son to go down on the, on the anger. You, you didn't get it right. See, that's what she's looking at. You didn't get it right. I live with my wife all the time. I wake up, hey, honey, how you doing? And she got that look. All she got to do is give me the look, and I already know what's going on. I, I, did, I didn't make it right. I didn't, I, didn't get, I didn't make it right. But you know why I didn't make it right? Because I'm so done with it. Done. And it wasn't resolved, though. She said, it wasn't resolved. And there's a lot of unresolved things. Old Samson, he's backslidden. So he's just, he just, he just wreaking, wreaking havoc with his anger. I mean, it, it, it's, it's amazing. So here it is. So it is obvious and understandable that the Philistines were upset. So they ask in verse 6, who, who has done this? And they dime Samson out and said, Samson, the son-in-law of Timnite. And then they tell him why. Because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. So the end of verse 6 says, so the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. Now, this is an incredible irony here. The Philistines told the woman, watch this, in chapter 14, in verse 15, if you don't get the secret to his riddle out of your husband, notice, we will burn you and your father's house with fire. She thought that it was okay to betray her husband, to preserve her life and the life of her father, but it backfired because they ended up getting burned anyway. Oh, precious ladies, precious ladies, it is never a good thing to betray your husband by telling intimate secrets or uh, disagreements about him to others because it will backfire on you and you end up getting burned. He will find out. He will find out what you said to family members, to friends, and people on social media, and you end up getting burned by his anger, like this woman did physically in these verses. Now, I am never going to justify a husband getting angry to the point where he becomes physical. But if he is angry for a season, ladies, just realize that these are the consequences of betraying your husband. The consequences. Consequences. Remember, now, men, remember what we said, Ephesians 4, 26. If you're going to be angry, don't let that sun go down. But, ladies, I'm telling you, if you get burned by his anger, it's because you betrayed him. You betrayed his trust by going to folks blabbing about what's going on. Men, let me, let me just help you. We're, we're poor communicators. We're terrible when it comes to communicating. So she got to talk. You don't want to talk, so she got to talk. You just got to just talk. They just talk. They just like talk and just talk. And after they're done talking, they want to talk some more. Good gracious. So when you don't talk, they got to find somebody to talk to. You know, when the Bible says, he who has an ear, they take that literally. They find anybody with an ear, and they're going to give them an earful. But ladies, when you do that, when you do that, and you betray them, when you get burned, don't, don't be shocked. Don't be shocked. Because we see... That it happened here. Now, look what it says there in verses 7 and 8. Verses 7 and 8 says, Samson said to them, Since you would do a thing like this, I will surely take revenge on you, and after that I will cease. So he attacked them hip and thigh with a great slaughter. Then he went down and dwelt in the cleft of the rock at Etam. Now, when Samson heard what they did to his wife and father-in-law, He said in verse 7, since you would do such a thing like this, I will surely take revenge on you, and after that I will cease. Now, none of this would have be none of this would be happening if Samson was right with God. None of it would have. 
Now he has taken revenge on them. And you know Romans 12 and verse 19 says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, which means give God room to avenge you. Why? For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. So if you are seeking to get someone back, <coughs> you are out of line. Because that is God's job, not ours. The reason why is because we will either get them back too much or not enough. And when God avenges us, he will be perfect and give them their just due. Also, we, we, we want vengeance to keep going on and on and on and on indefinitely. I mean, we want it just to keep going because those people hurt us. We want them to pay and pay and pay and pay some more. But God will get them just what their punishment deserves. This is why Samson said, watch this. This is why Samson said, I will surely take vengeance on them. And after that, I will cease. You, ca you catch that? We want them to keep paying. This is why Romans 12, 19 says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Because God knows that he will give them what they, they're just due and nothing more. This is why in the Old Testament, he says, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. You see, people are saying, no, that means I can get you back. You know, what, what God is saying, he's, he's given a limit on judgment and justice. An eye for an eye, no more. See, we want to, uh, they hit our eye, we want to hit both of their eyes. <laughs> See, no, no, just an eye for tooth foot. You knock, you knock my tooth out, I'm going to knock your whole grill out. <laughs> That's us. We, we can't, you can't be doing that. It has a limit. We want people to keep paying. As long as we're hurting, we want them to keep paying. No, Samson said, you know, I will get them. And then I will cease. It, it has a limit. Folks, it has a limit. You want them to keep getting, you want them to keep getting it. That 20 years later, oh, you hear something bad happen to them. Yes, yes. Keep getting them. Keep getting them. No, no. There has to be a limit. So, did Samson leave the Philistines in God's hands? Nope. Verse 8 says he attacked them hip and thigh which was a Hebrew idiom or expression, which meant from top to bottom, which was a great slaughter. Then he left to go to dwell in the cleft of the rock of Eton. I thought this was incredible. Uh, uh, Eton, there's two cities at that time was, uh, had this particular name. There was one to the north near the valley of uh, Sorek where Samson was from, and this is the uh, the city that's being referred to here. But notice where he goes. This, this is what blows me away. Notice where he goes. He goes to the cleft of the rock. The cleft of the rock is supposed to be the place of intimacy with God, the place uh, uh, that God reveals himself to us in a fresh and new way. It was the cleft of the rock that God took Moses he took Moses to so that his glory could pass by him, according to Exodus 33 and verse 20. So instead of going there to get right with God, instead of going there and having and experiencing a time of intimacy with God, he went there to hide from the Philistines. Instead of getting right with God. This is why Samson didn't allow God to avenge him because he was still in a backslidden condition. He should have been running to the cleft of the rock to get right with God. But instead, I, you know what? People are no different today. People come to church. Not, they, not, they don't come to get right with God. They, they come for all kinds of other reasons. Well, I saw a cute little girl there, so I'm going I'm to come on back. See if she's there again. Really? You're in a, you're not in a good place. You're supposed to come. This is the place of intimacy, a place of getting right with God. 
And instead, you, you trying to wink, wink at somebody, fooling around. And, and, and This is no different. Sam, uh, Samson should have gone there to get right with God. He should have said, you know what? I am out here, and I'm way out here. Look at, what's, look at my life. Look at what's happening in my life. But instead, he went there to hide. He went there to hide. <sighs> Boy. Look at verses 9 through 11. Now the Philistines went up and camped in Judah and deployed themselves against Lehi. And the men of Judah said, uh, why have you come up against us? So they answered, we have come up to arrest Samson to do to him just as he's done to us. Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Etam and, and said to Samson, Do you not know that the Philistines rule over us? What is this you have done to us? And he said to them, As they did to me, so I have done to them. Mm, mm, mm. So what Samson did to the Philistines was an act of war. So they went up and encamped in Judah and deployed themselves against the city of Lehi, according to verse 9. The men of Judah said in verse 10, uh, uh, you know, why, why are you stepping toward us in, in, in a little hostility, in a hostile kind of way? Or, you know, that's a Tony Clark translation. They said, why are you coming up against us? They answered, you know, we have no beef against you as a nation, but we came to arrest Samson. And the reason we brought our army, just in case you got a problem with this. Then they said, well, you know, we're we going to do to him just as he done to us. Oh, really? When, they, when the Israelites heard this, they took 3,000 men and went down to the cleft of the rock where Samson was hiding instead of praying. And said, do you not know that the Philistines rule over us? What a sad day when the people of God has given up the fight. That there's no fight left in the people of God. It almost describes the church today, in our world today. There's very little fight. All you got to do is say the, um, magic, the three magic words, I am offended. And the fight goes right out of Christians' lives. The Bible says in um, Proverbs 28, verse 1, the righteous are as bold as a lion. Where are the righteous today that are as bold as a lion? Today, all you got to do is say, I'm offended, and then everybody falls to pieces. Wow. What a sad day. Some people have said the fleshly Philistines in my life are too strong, and I'm tired of fighting against it, so let me just give in to it. That's what the Israelites were doing, and people say that today. No, don't give up the fight. Yes, our fleshly desires are strong, but continue to fight the good fight of faith. Ephesians 6 verses 10 through 18 tells us that we are in a battle. We're in a war. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against. See, it's not flesh and blood. You are still fighting flesh and blood. You still think that the battle is with that spouse or with that coworker or that family member or that neighbor. You're still looking at flesh and blood. The Bible said we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against. So it's not flesh and blood that we're wrestling with, but it is a wrestle. It is a fight that we're fighting. It's just not flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and spiritual hosts of wickedness. This is why he tells us to put on the whole armor of God so you'll be able to stand in the evil day, and watch this, and having done all to stand. There's not many people standing today. You say, I am offended, and the whole army of the church falls down. There's very few people standing. Where are the soldiers today, the soldiers of the Lord, that's going to stand even when the world is coming against them that's going to stand. Wow, where are we today? So you'll be able to stand against the strategies, the schemes of the wicked one. Don't give up like the Israelites did here. Stand, fight, fight for your families, your children, your teenagers. Fight for your morality, fight. We need to fight. And today, few people want to fight. They're like, the Isra they're like the Israelites. They've given up the fight. Oh, I just, uh, 
we need to fight. When they told Samson that the Philistines rule over, they said, Philistines rule over us. And, and they says, and what have you done to us? This is what they said. This is such a true statement. They said, what have you done to us? They came to Samson, what have you done to us? Men, single parents, when we go down spiritually, we take everyone we are over with us. Samson was a judge, but spiritually he has gone down and they came to him and said, what have you done to us? So often our families have said the same thing to us when we have gone down spiritually. Dad, single mom or single dad, what have you done to us? What have you done to our family? Look, look at where we are. We, 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 we lost our house. We lost our car. We lost, we, we got to leave. What have you done to us? And, and our, our families say this, whenever we go down, whoever we're overseeing, whether it's a department on the job or what, it's what have you done to us? They're saying this to us. Then Samson said at the end of verse 11, as they did to me, so I have done to them. Wait a minute. This is the philosophy of the world, which was seen in verse 10 by the Philistines. We have come to arrest Samson and do to him as he has done to us. Now, Samson is saying the same thing, quoting the world. This is what happens to us when we too, like Samson, have gone down spiritually. We take on the philosophy of the world instead of the uh, word of God. The philosophy of the world is do to them what they have done to you. God's word says in Matthew 7, 12, commonly called the golden rule, therefore whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. Just the opposite. Samson is following and living by the world's philosophy. Are you doing the same thing? Many of you, you, I, you, you quote more of the world than I hear you quoting scripture. Uh, and I see it, you know, on social media as well. That's why many of you don't want to be my friend because you don't want me to see it. That's okay. That's fine. You don't want me to see that tomfoolery that you, you posted. And the, 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 the philosophy of the world. That's all right. I'm going to go through and uh, look, scan this congregation. I'm going to go through and friend all, uh, friend all y'all. That I'm going to go and just friend. And when you don't accept it, I know. It's tomfoolery going on. I, you watch. When I get home, I'm friending all y'all. <laughs> we, 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 we take on the philosophy of the world. We talk just like the world. You know, oh, no, it's not a sin, it's a disease. I always tell people if, 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 if alcoholism is a disease, then get people the medicine to cure them. If it's a disease. If, if you have cancer, they got some medicine for that. If you have some kind of disease, they have medicine for that. If alcoholism is a disease, then what, what's the prescription for that? What, what, what do you, you go to the pharmacy and say, what's the prescription for alcoholism? They're going to say, excuse me? It's a disease, isn't it? Well, yes. Well, then what, what's the medicine? What is it called? And how much do I take of it? What's the doses? See, and, and now things that the Bible calls sin is now a disease. Now, can that sin Kicks, cause the body to break down to where a disease come upon it? Sure. But it's a sin. Sin caused it. And, and, but though you, you, you have folks that try to fight me when I say God called it a sin, and then they say, no, but it's a disease, Pastor Tony. Oh, you know. And, and this person has this, and he's that, and he's, you know, and everyone wants to have some, I don't know, this is the weirdest world I ever lived in in my life. Everyone wants some kind of label. Everybody wants a label. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to be called by any of those things. But then some people take a badge of honor. I'm, I'm bipolar. <laughs> Who told you that? Well, no, well, I just think I am. And because of the internet, people are doctors now. They self-diagnose themselves. 
fooling around. And then the doctors, they so stressed out and stuff. You, you go there and say, I'm bipolar. They say, oh, well, yeah, okay, let me write this for you. <laughs> well, what test was done? Did they take a piece of your brain and examine it to really determine this thing? Oh, you know, and, I'm, and this, this message, of course, will go around the world. I'm telling the world, save your letters. I will not read them. I won't read your internet uh, diagnosis. I won't do it. I'm not reading them. So let's put that out. It's a crazy world. We live, we're nuts today. Every other commercial is some kind of medicine, some kind of pill, some kind of, I can't even pronounce half of them. And then, then, then it's this, it's this. Well, uh, uh, taking this medicine will cause dizziness, blindness, disease, uh, cause, uh, uh, cause death, suicidal thoughts. I'm like, why would I take this? I already told you I'm, I'm crazy. I'm nuts anyway. Then you're going to tell me this will make me worse? Good grief. This world is nuts. I'm telling you, I don't have a problem with saying this world is nuts. It's nuts. It, it needs Jesus Christ badly. <laughs> and, and, you know, and I'm going to tell you, and I know you mean well, I'm going to tell you too, when I'm sending out there after service, don't, don't come and say, you know, uh, you know, I got this prescription. I don't care. I really, I don't care. I care about your soul. I don't care. I care about all that stuff you pumping in your body. I don't care. I don't care. I really don't. I don't care. Pastor, you don't care? No. No. <laughs> no. No, I let you work that out with your doctor and all that stuff. And don't you leave here either. All right? You know what I'm going to say. Don't you leave here fooling around trying to dump your medicine and say, Pastor Tony said, don't you, you come up in here nuts and stuff. That our security will run you right up out of here. You better take your medicine unless your doctor tell you different. Don't come up in here nuts. Crazy, and you know, look, why I'm just you, you didn't take your medicine, did you? Get out, go get your medicine. Don't be fooling around here. I know some of you. Pastor Tony said I didn't have to take it. Don't the devil is a lie. I didn't tell you that. I did not tell you that. You better take that those pills. I'm just saying. That's not even in my notes. That was free for somebody. Somebody needed that. That was free. Coming in, we're, you know, wired, we're crazy, and so we look. Oh, well, I tell our security all the time, watch that one. Come in, wired. Pastor, I haven't, no, how are you? I said, you ain't on your medicine, are you? No, no. <laughs> Get out. Go back home. Go take your medicine. Come on back afterwards. Good grief. Oh. Oh, boy. So, here it is, the Philistines. They go to Samson, I mean, not uh, Philistines, the Israelites. They come to Samson and say, well, what have you done to us? What, what, what have you done to us? What have you done to our family? Then Samson, at the end of verse 11, says, as they did to me, so I've done to them. And here it is, taking on the philosophy of the world. Let me stop right there. I, yeah, I got to stop right there. We got baptism to do. We pick it up. We pick it up next time. We pick it up when we get to, um, next week in verse 12. Put that in my notes. Start right here. Pick it up where we left off. Because we ain't done with this. We ain't done. We got, you know, some folks trying to pull, pull out that purse. Now they peel. You better take it. Crazy, coming up like crazy and nuts and stuff. Don't do that. Do that to us. So, you know, great, great set of verses. I got to put, we went to verse 11. Because if I mess it up, my note takers will be, no, you're verse 11, verse 11. <laughs> okay. We're going to pick it up in verse 8. It was verse 11. Good night. I'm like, whoa, okay, okay. Okay, they, they, they're, my, they're my little scribes. 
They, they make sure they keep me squared away. So, amen to that. Amen. So, you know, let me, let me conclude with this. Let me conclude with this. Because we, we saw what happens when we began to, when we began to backslide. When we began to backslide, the, the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God is grieved. The Spirit of God is grieved. And when the Spirit of God is grieved, it can't produce the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and, and, and kindness, and self-control. It can't produce those things in us because it, the Spirit is grieved. So just realize, if you're in that condition, just know, just know what's going to take place. Just know what's going to happen. You're going to have anger problems. You can't get along with people. It is always a sign that your vertical is off with God because you're horizontal. You can't get along with people. You can't. And you need to, you, 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 if that's you today, you want to get that right with God before you leave today. You want to get, you want to get it right with the Lord. Because it's a sign that you're in a backslidden condition. You're snapping on everybody, snapping on the kids, snapping at work. You talk about how you're just so stressed, you know. It, it's, it's a sign that things aren't right between you and God. And so this is an opportunity as we close in prayer. It's an opportunity to get things, to get things right, get things right with the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you that you love us and you share these things with us. And Lord, I just pray for your people here, and I pray, God, that you will stir their hearts. Lord, they know that they're in a backslidden condition. Lord, they know, God, that they need to get things right with you. Lord, I just pray that they repent of their sin, that they would get things right with you. Dear God, I just pray that your spirit would draw them to repentance. Your word says it's the goodness of God that leads one to repentance. And so, Lord, draw your people to you. Draw your people to you, Lord. Lord, hear their prayers as they're praying and crying out to you now. Lord, there's some here that's seeking revenge. They're seeking to get someone back. Lord, I pray that they will surrender that attitude and that heart to you. There's some, Lord, who have allowed the sun to go down on their anger. They've allowed the sun to go down. Lord, I pray, I pray, Lord, that they bring that anger to the foot of the cross. Lord, I pray, do a work, do a work in your people's hearts. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here who has not repented of their sin and accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior, I pray that today will be the day of salvation for them. Draw them to you, Lord. Draw them to you by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.